Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome. This webinar is hosted by the Oregon Farmers Markets Association. Uh, we support farmers markets across the state with training and advocacy and promotion. And we have monthly meetups for market staff across the state, plus workshops like this. We have something scheduled almost every week, all the way through September this year. You can check out our 2024 schedule online and see what's coming next. A couple of things about how our sessions work. We hope you'll be comfortable here. Feel and so that means be on camera, be off camera, whatever helps you attend. Uh, we love your participation. Um, and that's in the chat or out loud or using emojis or using the reaction button. There'll be time for questions and sharing and our presenter will let you know how she wants you to speak up and contribute. So today we're gonna to hear from Farmers Market Pros, which is the community for people who do markets. If you're not following Farmers Market Pros, then you are totally missing out. Um, today, Oregon has Cat Fields White all to ourselves and she's here to help us answer the question, can there be too many markets? What do you do when a new event pops up that feels like it's coming in on your market's territory? And actually, just to say, this topic was developed out of a real life situation that came up this year amongst three Oregon markets. And so I'm really looking forward to hearing how we can all collaborate and communicate better. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Kat. So thanks and have you introduce yourself and say hello. Great. Welcome, everybody. I'm kind of glancing through the chats here. And so many of you, your closest market is Oh, there's one that's two and a half miles away. That's the one we talked about earlier. Um, just noticing how many of you have closest markets that are 15 or 16 miles away. Um, and in the market environment that I work in, there are markets within blocks of us um, in San Diego. There's so many markets that are so close together. And I'm imagining that probably uh, Mara, maybe who's in Portland, has that, a similar situation where there's markets really close and some of y'all are, are out a little bit farther so that they're spread out. Um, just to refresh you on who I am. I'm Kat Fields White. I'm the farmers of uh, the founder of Farmers Market Pros. We hold a conference, a national farmers market conference every year in San Diego, and it will be in San Diego again in 2025. Um, we do online classes, we do one-on-one -on -one and group consultations, and we host uh, Tent Talk, which is the weekly farmers market for people, uh, podcast for people in farmers markets, not for people who shop at farmers markets, but for actually all of y'all in the tents, um, farmers and vendors and market managers. And I'm looking at our analytics lately, and I think maybe our biggest claim to fame is that every Friday on Instagram, we post a meme which is meant to kind of laugh at ourselves and others that are involved in farmers markets. And that's probably where we get our single most engagement outside of the, uh, the conference. So I'm glad you're enjoying those and get a chance to laugh at ourselves and, and what we do. Um, thank you for all the comments in the chat. That's helpful to know that who we're talking to today and what we're going to be talking about as Amanda mentioned is uh, can there be too many farmers markets in a perfect world? My answer would just be an, unequivocal no there cannot be too many farmers markets there should be one on every corner and they should alternate days and time so that there's always one available for whoever wants to shop but we have practicalities to deal with so let's talk a little bit about um, what the the realistic real life situation is and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing when another market is getting ready to open near you and how you can make that an opportunity as opposed to a, a potential place for conflict or or fear or um, worrying about it. So can there be too many farmers markets? Um, I mean, that's the question that we want to answer, right? And, and all of us talk about that. And we want there to be more farmers markets. We want more people buying from local farmers and from small businesses. We want people to be eating food that's grown locally versus relying on a commodity food system, one that's totally based on profit and not as concerned with what the effect is on small farmers or on our health. So I mean, we'd all answer no to that, right? Can there be too many, many farmer's markets? But if we rephrase the question a little bit, can there be too many farmer's markets competing for my market shoppers and with, for my market's farmers and vendors? Sometimes we get a different answer from folks. It's natural. We are operating businesses. We are trying to balance the needs of our community with our own financial challenges and with our farmers and vendors availability and bandwidth. And so sometimes when we hear about a new market coming into our area um, or look at the markets that already exist around us, 
that question feels a little bit different and our answer may feel a little bit different. So the good news is when we ask who shops at local farmers markets, more people every year. So if that's the case, maybe we need more markets. A few years ago, as little as five or six years ago, the accepted percentage in terms of data and studies and research was that roughly three to 4% of Americans were shopping at farmer's markets on any regular basis. That's about how many people relied on farmer's markets for their groceries. Now, there may be a few more people than that even back then that were visiting as tourists because it's a good thing to do when you travel to see what's happening. And there were a few people that popped in from time to time. But in terms of people that actually relied on farmer's markets for their grocery needs, it was a pretty small percentage. Most folks were shopping at grocery stores in America. That has changed significantly, partly because of the growth of the number of markets, partly because I think all of us who operate farmers markets or who operate in farmers markets have gotten a little bit smarter about marketing and getting the word out and outreach to people. We do this in a more kind of serious professional way, maybe, than um, some farmers markets were formed in the past. We're serious about getting the word out. There's has been some terrific media and there's um Food, Michael at uh, Omnibus Dilemma, sorry, skipped my note there. Um, more just general media information on the importance of shopping locally and the nutritional advantage of getting local food. And so more and more people are shopping in farmer's markets all the time. Uh, the latest survey that I've seen is that roughly 12% of Americans shop at farmer's markets regularly. Uh, Penn State's recent survey of farmers market shoppers find that most farmers market shoppers are shopping there something like 63 percent of local farmers market shoppers are shopping at markets regularly it's one of the basic places that they rely on for groceries so it's not a casual stop in they're not just coming in to take selfies they're not just coming out because it's a nice day they're actually re relying on farmers markets and small farmers produce and local businesses foods much more regularly than they used to. And that's really good news. We've picked up an enormous amount of market share, partly because people want to know where their food comes from, partly because we're doing a little bit better job of making it available. So if that's the case, and maybe we do need new markets because we have more shoppers, then we need to look at thinking about adding markets in almost every demographic in almost every community. And so these are some of the things that we want to think about when we think about, is it time to add a new market to your community, to your area? So does the community need one? That gets a little bit tricky. And if you're a farmer's market manager, I'm going to guess that you, like me, have had plenty of people contact you and say, hey, I'm starting a new housing development. We'd like to attract some attention to the area. We think it'd be pretty if we had a farmer's market here every week. Is that a community need? So that's somebody trying to create a sense of ambiance. And what we do when we get an inquiry like that is we usually try to dig down some and see, does your community really need a grocery store? What's the level of occupancy of this housing development where you want to have a market? Um, are you looking for a place to hang out? Not a bad thing. Get to know your neighbors? Certainly not a bad thing. And buy groceries? Because that's a necessary part of the, the need quotient. If they just want to come hang out, and they just want a place to play, maybe look at starting a new park. But if they want to start a farmer's market, they're going to need to be willing to shop because as we all know, our farmers and vendors can't survive unless the people that attend the market attend regularly and actually pay for what they're producing. If you're thinking about starting a new market or if somebody in your area is, is looking at starting a new market, what's the effect going to be on farmer and vendor availability? And that's an important question when we look at starting new markets. I honestly don't believe there's a shortage of shoppers. There's still a lot of people, that other 88% of the population that's shopping mostly at farmers at grocery stores. And I think many of them can be converted to farmer's market shoppers if we have enough markets so that we have enough convenience, so that we have enough times and days that we have markets available. We have plenty of shoppers. What we need is the farmers and vendors to fill those markets, and they need to be farmers and vendors that are filling them because they are producing enough that they have things to sell, and not just because they have a loyalty to a neighborhood or, or to a market manager. Those are great things, but let's be fair to them and make sure that they have a reliable supply of things that they need to sell. If you're going to start a new market, do you have the staff bandwidth to do that? 
Are there enough people in your organization? Can you find people that understand the needs of markets and can be trained or have experience in dealing with retail customers and also farmers and vendors and marketing and all the things that's required to actually create a successful market? You want to look at the trade area capacity. So are there enough residents living there or enough steady supply of visitors? If you're in an area that attracts um, vacation visitors or temporary visitors, are there enough humans there that need to grocery shop? That's a key question before you look at opening another market. Now, it may be that you've got enough people in the area, but you don't have enough people to service two markets or three markets or four markets. And so just as when you're growing a market and you try to do that teeter-totter between number of shoppers and number of vendors, each of which affect each other, um, you've got to watch that too when you're looking at opening new markets. How many people are in that trade area? What kind of traffic pattern brings them to the area? Does it bring them to the area regularly during the days and times that you're thinking about opening? You want to look at differentiation of mission or mix. So you can look at an area when grocery stores do this or when big retailers do this, they look at how many competitors are in the area in terms of other existing businesses, but they also look at what kinds of existing businesses those are. Can a low cost farmer's market or grocery store come into an area that already has a Whole Foods or a very high end kind of market? Sure. Absolutely. A lot of times they can manage that because you're looking at two different variations of the same function and you're playing to slightly different audiences for both. As long as your trade area has enough humans in it, if you can provide a differentiated market or differentiated offerings, it may make complete sense to add a market very close to yours, maybe in the day before, maybe the weekend if you're on a weekday. And then can you create a market that's got financial viability? So it, if you're in a trade area where farmers and vendors are used to paying little or nothing for a space, can you start a new market and figure out how to support that? Are there going to be grants or, or subsidies available for a second market in your area? Does somebody want to pay to promote? that market? Does somebody want to at least pay startup costs while you're getting your footing? Financial viability is a key element to whether or not a new market's going to succeed and how it's going to affect the market near the, ex the place that they're looking to start. So when you look at trade area capacity, and this is straight from grocery store and retail research, um, they look at a, a certain number of things. So if you're going to open a, a grocery store, you're looking at what's the population in that area? What's the traffic flow? What's the foot traffic, which tends to be even more um, typical for farmer's markets? What other available grocery options are there? And in our case, how many existing farmer's markets are there? And I will note that Paco Underhill and other people that study grocery store operations and that are constantly analyzing whether a grocery store should open in an area have now added existing farmer's markets to the questions that they ask when they look at whether or not an area can handle another grocery store. This was not a determining factor for them even six or seven years ago, never came up. That is not something that they looked at. They are now looking at farmer's markets as legitimate sources of competition and legitimate sources of foot traffic and population traffic and the people's tendency to regard an area as a place that they go to buy groceries and to find food. So good news for us. We've actually gotten on their radar and we are a legitimate source of competition for grocery stores. Doesn't mean we don't compete with each other in terms of farmer and vendor availability, but we are certainly making a mark on shoppers. So when they analyze all of these things, they want to look at population. Generally speaking, for a, a big box grocery store that's open seven days a week, they're looking for a minimum of 5,000 people in an area to support a grocery store. So if you've got an overall population of 100,000, like um, Hillsborough does, you know, you could handle 20 grocery stores. How many farmers markets can you handle? Let's see. It depends on traffic flow. There may be things that the local population is very aware of in terms of this set of population won't cross this street to shop. And I think anybody knows in their own neighborhoods what those traffic flows are. Not easily to not easy to analyze from outside, but people who are studying these things know, and you probably know when it comes to starting a new market. You can be on one street, six blocks away from another street, and one of those is gonna be much more successful. 
Foot traffic in our case is generally very relevant. So you wanna watch for that if at all possible. If you are blessed with a gigantic parking lot very nearby that you have access to, you can resolve some of that lack of foot traffic. But many of us um, do rely on being in an area where people walk. And then we too, just like the grocery stores have to look at where what there is is in terms of existing farmers markets in addition to other grocery stores. We need to be looking at what kind of grocery options are available, not just in terms of another farmer's market in the area, but what other kinds of grocery stores are available in the area. If what we're going to be doing is selling farm produce and other small maker food op options, we need to know where else people can shop. I have not looked at the chat, so Amanda, if you're seeing something relevant, holler at me, or if one of you wants to unmute and pop in, you're welcome to do that as well. I'll probably catch up on the chat when then. Well, it looks like there is a quick question about the 5K. What what area is 5K stand? Um, 5K is typically considered within 1.5 miles of their grocery. And we're talking about a big box grocery store that has to support itself seven days a week, oftentimes now 24 hours a day. Um, so they're looking for a trade area that has 5,000 people in the one and a half to five mile area around the grocery store. So part of all that grocery store research is what's called Riley's Law of Retail Gravitation. So people are attracted to larger retail communities. And a larger retail community can mean within a small rural area or a very small city or town that the retail community is large. So oftentimes people in a very small town or small community are shopping on the main street in that town, what they would call the high street in the old country. Um, so people are attracted to going places where there's a multitude of options for shopping. Generally speaking, you're not gonna see one retailer on one street and one retailer on another street and one retailer on four streets or four blocks over. They're gonna, they're gonna attract into a clump and into an area where it's simple for people to go straight there and find all the options that they need. That's limited by time and distance. So a larger group of retailers that's six miles from your house may not be as appealing as the corner store that's a block and a half from you. So our hyper-local attitude where oftentimes we're opening in an area that doesn't have a lot of retail options um, is also important. People are limited in how long they'll travel and how much time they'll take to go where they need to shop, especially when it comes to something like buying daily groceries. This can have a little bit different metrics when you're looking at retailers that are selling appliances or furniture or things that people don't buy very often. But on the day-to-day -day shopping side of things, time and distance becomes a barrier. So overall, what Riley says is more options for goods and services attracts more shoppers. So the more critical mass you can develop in your general area, the more likely people are to think of your area when they think about where they're gonna go to shop. Really easy to see this in the restaurant community. You almost always see the very busiest restaurants near other busy restaurants. That's just how that works because people have in their heads that that's where you go to go out to eat. And we've talked about this a little bit in previous webinars when we talk about curating and thinking about, should you limit your market to one meat vendor? Well, if you do that, people are going to think about that's where you go to shop from that meat vendor. If you have several, people are going to start to think that, oh, I need meat. Let's go see what's at the market. So oftentimes more choices attract more people. So successful businesses attract successful businesses. Busy farmers markets attract new farmers markets. If you're wondering why somebody's looking at starting a market near you, it's probably because you look like you've got a successful operation. And so they're figuring that that must be a successful place to have a farmer's market. Why would they go start one somewhere where people are not used to shopping at farmer's markets? So consider yourself a little bit flattered if somebody's looking at starting a market a mile or two from you. It probably means that you look like you're doing a good job. More options actually doesn't usually mean less business for each of those options. If there's a lot of people coming to an area to shop and they're doing that because there's multiple days they can choose from to shop at a market, it's probably gonna help you. Many, many years ago, several lifetimes back, uh, I, was, I owned a coffee house. And at the time, coffee houses were relatively new. We had to paint a uh, phonetic description of how to say cappuccino on our wall because otherwise people stumbled over it. They didn't know what to ask for. Coffee houses were not a daily thing. 
And then Starbucks hit the road. They were strong in Seattle. They started there and then they blasted out nationally. And what they typically did was look for a location that was near a busy local coffee house. It was their absolute MO for finding locations. I used to say that what I really needed on the, the back of my car was a bumper sticker that said, follow me to the next Starbucks location. Because if I was out looking for locations, they absolutely were talking to the potential landlord the next day. And a lot of people that were in my business at the time got really nervous and they were really unhappy and they were very afraid that what Starbucks was going to do was put all independent coffee houses out of business. And that's absolutely not what happened. What happened instead was Starbucks taught people that it was okay to pay three or $4 for a cup of coffee and whatever it is now, seven or eight. Uh, and the more Starbucks came in, the more people frequented their local coffee house. They got that this was a community place. This was a third place. It was a good idea to go get your coffee in the morning. Is it cheaper and easier to make it at home? Yeah, probably. But it was the thing to do was to buy good coffee out at some cute place that maybe had a pastry or two in the case as well. So having more options in your area doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have less business. Starbucks absolutely increased the income of thousands of local coffee houses back then, and they continue to do it now. New markets can maybe do the same for you. So that when we look at grocery research, definitely applicable to what we do. We are retailers. We are grocery stores in the street. We are, in one way or another, little shopping malls when we set up our farmer's markets. But we have a few other variables to take into account. So obviously, none of us operate seven days a week like grocery stores or retailers. So there's a lot of things that we can consider when we're looking at what whether or not it makes sense to have an additional farmer's market in our neighborhood or within our overall trade area. We look at specific days and times. So we are a morning market or we're an afternoon market or sometimes we're a night market. We operate probably one, sometimes two of the days in the week. Oftentimes we focus on specific products. So generally speaking, if you look at a, a larger box grocery store, they're going to have everything from produce to meat to fish to toilet paper. Some of those things we don't carry. And depending on our individual markets, sometimes we lean strongly to one area or another. Maybe we're really farm focused and we have the luxury and the privilege of having a lot of small farmers in our area. So almost all of our vendor booths are filled with farmers. That's terrific. If we're adding some other things on so that we make it a one-stop shop for shoppers, that puts us in a better position to compete with a local grocery store. If we're really focused on farms and another farmer's market that's in our area or two miles down the road is focused on some farms, but really more on maybe fishermen, for instance. Um, maybe they're focused on culturally diverse value-added products. Maybe they're carrying a lot of hot food. So people come there to eat after school and after they get off work while they do their grocery shopping and their farmer availability is not as wide as yours. Just because there's another market near you doesn't mean it's a duplication of your market. We are so much more personalized and customized than a standard grocery store is. Our farmer and vendor base is going to be different from market to market. That's not typical for a grocery store. Most grocery stores, you're seeing the same products over and over and over from one store to another. We oftentimes have very different mixes of farmers and vendors. And so people get to know us by those folks. We also have to look at farmer and vendor bandwidth when we're taking into account whether it's a good idea to open a new market. That's not like a typical grocery store. They're mostly buying wholesale and they're mostly getting it, if not from a local farmer, then they're probably getting it from a farmer in Chile or they're getting it from a major uh, produce warehouse that's 10 miles away or 50 or a thousand miles away. So they don't have the things that we need to take into account in terms of, of variables when they look at whether or not it's going to be dangerous or, or a concern for them to open a new market or have somebody else open a new grocery store near them. And we also have to look at site availability site availability, which in our case tends to change much more than it does for a major retailer or a grocery store. Typically, they lock in a space, they sign a lease, they're good to go. With us, we're often trying to fit into a city street with ever-changing regulations. We may or may not be allowed to be in the same place next year. Maybe we're setting up in a parking lot or a piece on a piece of land that's eventually going to be developed. And when that development starts, 
then we're stuck again. So when we're looking at what the effect is of another market opening in our area, we have to take a few different things into account that other grocery stores and retailers don't have to think about. And that's why it can make it a little bit scary when we hear that there's another market coming into our area. Are they competing for the same really limited spaces that we have available to operate in? Are they taking up our farmers and vendors bandwidth? And will that mean that those farmers and vendors can't come to our market? So we're all in this together is the thing. And so we don't have to say, oh my gosh, there's another farmer's market coming in, we're in trouble. We look like grocery stores, but we're a little different. We're more in our communities and we have more personal relationships typically with the people that we're dealing with, whether it's our farmers and vendors, or hopefully, whether it's the other manager that's down the road in a market not too far from us, that might be thinking of adding a, an additional market that week that's a little closer to us. And that's not necessarily a good feeling unless we know from them that they're planning to differentiate their market in a way that won't affect us at all, might make our community happy, might make them more in the habit of, of going out and shopping locally rather than pulling into a parking lot and grabbing a cart. We can use human perspective and we are much more agile and in a much better place to do that than large retailers and large grocery stores are. So what we need to do is to communicate and collaborate. And sometimes that gets tricky. We are by nature somewhat competitive people. We are by nature a little bit afraid and insecure about our own position. I'm not talking to any of you individually, but just humans as a, a general kind of animal. We're a little bit nervous about people taking up our territory or maybe using up um, the success or the, the uh, resources that we have available. We're not sure there's gonna be enough to go around, but there probably is. And the key to keeping things smooth and to not making anybody feel nervous and to not affecting people's business badly is to communicate and collaborate. So if a new market is coming into your area, or if you're thinking about going into a new area, there's a few things that we can keep in mind. One is why not reach out to other markets? Now I'll tell you something, when Aldi is coming into an area where Whole Foods already exists. They don't call Whole Foods and say, hey, I'm going to move into your area. Are you okay with that? They don't call them and say, give them a heads up and say, you might want to increase your advertising. We're probably moving in a mile from you. But we can do that because we're agile and we're human and we're operating on human scale and a community scale. There's no good reason for us to not stop by a market near us and say, hey, you know, we've been looking at this area, we have a little more bandwidth now, we're thinking of opening in addition to our Saturday market, we're, getting, we're thinking about opening a weekday market. I'm not sure how that would affect you. How do you think it would affect you? Just want to say hi, reach out, maybe we can work on this together and talk about it so that everybody stays in a good place. And when they do that, if you as the existing market manager thinks about that as an opportunity, can we increase the activity here? Can we make the markets be more frequent in this area so our shoppers get in the habit of shopping at markets rather than relying on that seven day a week grocery store? If you think about, hey, maybe this market will have vendors that they don't have room for that they can kind of push my way. And I've got that waiting list of bakers that really are great little businesses and need a place to operate. Maybe I can send some of them over to this new market. Maybe we can get together on advertising. If you think about the opportunities rather than stiffening up and thinking, ooh, no, don't want somebody else in my neighborhood, you can avoid conflict. Maybe discuss with them the differentiation. What's your focus gonna be? Are you mostly farm? Are you looking at maybe a culturally different set of products? Are you going to be open in the morning when I'm open in the afternoon? Discuss what might make those, those markets different from one another. Consider the unintentional effects of having more markets in your neighborhood that maybe there will be more places to incubate farmers, that maybe there is a way to increase urban farm presence at your market and build a wider market culture that will serve your entire area and your entire industry, your entire form of serving your community and keeping them out of grocery stores because if we're gonna be competitive, that's really who we're competitive with, right? So you can find new possibilities with a new market. You can share vendor applications, 
Oftentimes we will have just a slew of market applications in one category. We don't have any room for them. We know that Hillcrest is looking for bakers, or we know that there's a new market opening that actually needs folks in that category. And this will get more people into our system. We want to encourage small farmers and small businesses to be able to make a living at farmers markets. So it's helpful for us for them to have more markets to operate in. Collaborating on marketing, marketing can be hugely successful. And when we get to kind of our chat and, and question and answer period here pretty soon, um, I'd love to talk to folks that are aware of, or maybe even participating in, I'm not sure if Montevilla is part of that, um, the Stay Rad, Stay Local program in Portland. I know that that's been amazing. And I know that the folks that I talked to that did go through an uncomfortable situation last year um, are talking about opening a similar kind of operation where you're sharing customers, you're providing them with a passport, you're encouraging them to go to multiple markets uh, in the area uh, that they're located in, in Washington, Washington County, I think it is, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, but the Western part, um, kind of West of Portland there. You can save on cooperative advertising. So sometimes things like print advertising or television or radio advertising are out of our reach as a single market. But what if all the markets in your area got together and bought a page in your local city magazine or Edible Portland or any of the kind of uh, venues that would, or the platforms that would get to your kind of customers? If you all get together and split the cost of that and list each of those markets and the days and hours that they're open, that can be a way to actually access way more shoppers than you could do on, in your own budget. And then you can work together to educate farmers and vendors to incubate new farmers and vendors, to refer them amongst you. If you've got a new market starting and you get to know them and have a chance to chat and find out maybe that their market manager is not somebody who's got long experience, letting them know that, hey, vendors all need to have insurance is a great way to make sure that your vendors aren't coming back to you and saying, oh, why do I have to give you insurance? I don't have to give that market insurance. Educating each other, getting together in groups, talking to other market managers can really help you educate vendors and farmers and so that they know what to expect, what the real costs are of doing business, what the best ways are to um, operate at a market so that they're profitable and that your market is predictable for everybody in your area. So new markets, the recommendations are reach out to existing markets in a spirit of cooperation and respect existing relationships. We all know that one of the worst things that happens or one of the most unsettling things that happens when a new market comes into your area is that they've probably strolled your market and talked to all your vendors or they've sent a mass email to all your vendors that they've somehow managed to accumulate into a spreadsheet and said, hey, we're starting this new market. You might want to switch over. That's not how you're going to win friends and influence people in this situation. What you want to do is say hi to the market manager. Typically, I think we've talked about the etiquette of, of market management and the difference between recruiting and poaching is that you don't go recruit at a Saturday market for a new Saturday market. You recruit at a Saturday market for a Wednesday market. Um, you respect the relationships that the farmers and vendors have with their existing managers and markets. Now, that's not to say that as an existing market manager, you can expect for everybody to stay with you if a new market comes in and is doing a stronger job of marketing. If they're doing more for their vendors to build their sales, at some point, those vendors and farmers may have to consider that even though they have a big affection and loyalty to you, they need to be in markets where the, the sales are highest. So be sure that you're talking to one another and that you're pointing out all the various advantages to farmers and vendors of maybe being in multiple markets. Their, their existence at one market can be a marketing effort for their existence at another market. And if you all work together to talk to your farmers and vendors and respect the relationships that they have with each manager, you will end up in a better position than trying to take a, a conflict stance. And established markets, when a new market comes to you, you want to welcome them with the idea of suggesting alternatives and solutions. Maybe a market's coming in and they want to start on the same Thursday that you do. And we'll talk in just a minute about a situation in um, outside of Portland that that was the case. Instead of saying, whoa, we don't need another farmer's market in this neighborhood, maybe pointing out that, hey, what about a Tuesday market? People have been asking about that. Or what about a, a Thursday market instead of a Wednesday? Um, be prepared to add, suggest some solutions as opposed to dropping right into conflict mode. And that can be really helpful. And 
bear in mind that the statistics will show you that more may be better. More markets may actually convince more people that the inconvenience of shopping at farmer's markets isn't as inconvenient if there are two in your area or three in your area on various days and at various times when the shoppers are available. It may not be a bad thing to have more markets, even though that may sound crazy when you hear that a market's moving in close to you. So if more mar farmer's markets lead to more farmer's market shoppers, which leads to farmers and vendors being able to make more markets, which leads to more small farmers, people that can afford to stay in farming or in small food businesses, which means you've got more farmers, which means you're going to need more markets to put them in, which means you might get more farmer's market shoppers. You have a spiral that's a really, really lovely positive thing. So I've had a chat, um, Amanda had suggested to me that we talk about this topic because there was a group of markets um, west of Portland where an existing market had been there for a while, um, an even older market up the road had been there for even longer, and then a market that exists on a Saturday decided to open a weekday market. And from what I can tell from talking to people involved, and I will say that one of those markets was not part of this discussion, and they, their manager, in fact, has changed in the meantime, so it's hard to get history of what they were thinking. But what seemed to come down to, and when talking to everybody involved, was this. They were really unhappy and nervous when somebody came in and decided to do a pilot market on the same day as a market within two and a half miles of them. And these look to me like not tiny towns. I've checked the population on all of them. There's really not a reason that traffic area and that market area couldn't handle another market, but maybe not on the same day and at the same time. Um, but I think the biggest problem is the old Maya Angelou quote, which is, it's not what you say or do, it's how you make people feel. And what really seemed to be the barrier when I talked to, to the folks that I've talked to now that were involved with all of those markets wasn't even so much that this Saturday market wanted to open a weekday market. It's that they didn't bother to, to engage in any kind of communication. And when somebody reached out to them and said, hey, I'm nervous, you're looking at starting a market two and a half miles from me that's on the same day and at the same time, they didn't really seem to very proactively come back and say, hey, good point. Maybe we should do this on another day. Although, as it turns out, it looks like they are doing it on another day now. They're doing it on the same day as a market 11 miles up the road. And they appear to be very differentiated. So the, the new market that's coming in seems to be a market that is designed to serve a new housing development, which is one of those approaches that when people come to us looking to start uh, a market in that kind of a development, we usually say, eh, let's make sure that you actually got enough shoppers there. But it, they appear to think that they do have enough shoppers there. They have a completely different tone from what I can tell that of the market 11 miles up or the market two miles away. And it doesn't appear to me that they're going to affect shoppers in any way. It would also occur to me, and this tends to be the most, the biggest concern when you've got a new market starting somewhere near you in our industry, is that we work with a finite number, especially of farmers. We do have more food vendors that we can incubate, and we can incubate farmers, but it takes a lot of time. So the big fear, I think, when there's new markets coming into your area is, am I, are they going to take my farmers? Are they going to stretch our farmers bandwidth to the point where they have to make a choice between one market or another, and they can't continue with my market where my shoppers and I have grown to depend on them. It appears, and it's really hard to tell because it's in early stages, but from talking to the, the two markets, one, and I don't know if you want me to call out names here, but I think there's at least one person involved that was in this. So wave at me if, if you want to actually refer to the names of the markets, but talking to them more deeply and asking more questions, it appears that they're really not pulling the same vendors and farmers. There's maybe a little bit of overlap, but generally speaking, they're developing new markets or new farmers and vendors. They're actually pulling some farmers and vendors from their large market on Saturday, which is a really typical way to start a new smaller market is for a large organization that has a large market to, to pull vendors over to get that started. Um, there seems to be a little bit of concern that staffing is tight for farmers markets in that area and that the new market may be trying to recruit staffers from other markets that might help them. And they're a little bit worried about that. Um, but there doesn't seem to be so far an actual bad effect from this. The bad effect is that there has not been communication. 
And so the existing markets are feeling a little threatened and they're feeling uncomfortable about the fact that the market organization that's expanding doesn't seem to have any interest in addressing their concerns or their questions or relating to them. Again, digging in a little bit farther, it appears that that existing large market organization that's adding a market has also changed managers in the last couple of months. And my guess is, in looking at this situation, that that new manager is probably over their head in terms of figuring out how to run a farmer's market. They've had other event experience. We have found over and over that people that know how to manage annual events don't necessarily know how to manage farmer's markets. It's a whole different animal and the relationships are different. And so... To give them the benefit of the doubt, I would suggest to everybody there that they try to think that maybe once this person is up to speed, they'll come around and um, and want to chat. And chatting is healthy, whether you're talking about a new market moving into your area or whether you just want to make sure that you're together and that you have relationship before something exciting hits. I know that we were not in touch with some of the farmer's market managers in our geographic area at the markets that my team manages prior to COVID. We knew about each other. We would wave at each other at farm dinners and events. We didn't really talk to each other much. There was some dispute between two older managers that have been around for a long while and everybody else, rather than take sides, just kind of said, well, we'll just we'll mind our business and we'll pay attention to our markets. But when COVID hit and we were dealing with state and local regulations that very much changed how we had to operate, we had to become reliant on each other. It made so much more sense and it gave us so much more power for us to talk to one another and be able to figure out new procedures and present them to local authorities to be able to campaign for the state folks to classify us as an essential service. If you have all that in place when you're not dealing with the crisis, you're so far ahead when something comes up. If you have all of that in place when maybe a big grocery store moves into your area and you really do have somebody with a lot of money for advertising that's going to compete with you, it's so valuable to have relationships with your fellow market managers already so that you can get together to do some outreach, to share email lists, to get remind people that where you want to shop is the farmer's market. So I do know that there was an awkward situation west of Portland, and it sounds to me like when I talked to somebody this morning, I said, we're going to talk about what happened and what the resolution was. And her response was that, well, I'm not sure we've seen a resolution, but it also doesn't sound like it feels like a crisis anymore. It sounds like basically it strengthened the relationship between two of the markets, the other market, again, hoping that they will come around once they get kind of caught up and, and on top of their situation. But I think the the missing element that really caused the entire problem was just a lack of communication. So anything that you can do to keep in touch with your fellow market managers, I know that OFMA um, runs peer-to-peer -peer meetings. And I know you have, I think you have a list share, right, Amanda? Yeah, so there's a lot of ways that you can reach out to people. You can reach out on a wider scale. I mean, we have a private group. FMC has a list serve for national farmers markets. Getting to know other market managers isn't scary. It's a true treasure. Talking to the people around you that are running markets, talking to farmers and vendors that are other at other markets and hearing what they have to say, this can all be so instructive and it can give you such an opportunity to improve your markets and to improve your community and to improve our industry. So that's what I've got for today. And I will be delighted to have us have a little discussion. I think that's one of my favorite parts of working with Oregon Farmers Market Association is that most of the time when we have these sessions, y'all are really forthcoming with opinions and questions and stories. And it that's what we're talking about. The more communication we can have, the more we can hear about each other's interests, the better we'll all be. So I don't know if anybody has uh, a specific question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to scan through the chat real quick and see if you posted anything. Uh, so Charlie's saying, I see programs as another variable, and that is absolutely true. So he says, we're collaborating more and more with Clamps Grown in support for their food hub operations, where the focus is connecting producers with institutions, schools, hospitals, and restaurants. So yes, programs are another way to differentiate your market. And maybe you're very involved with that, but another market down the road is just kind of giving people food on a, a Wednesday afternoon. Um, all of those things differentiate your market and can build 
build huge customer loyalty and also provide ways for you to learn and for your farmers and vendors to learn about other ways to increase their incomes as well, not to mention getting more fresh food to our communities. Fiona says, yes, folks who manage yearly events often don't know how to manage weekly events. It is so different. And managing farmers and managing artists is so different. <laughs> it's, uh, it sounds like the same business and there are some similarities, but there's a whole bunch of differences too. Sarah says, I'm struggling more with other events being confused with a farmer's market when they're just a maker's market or just a street fair. That is a huge problem. Um, that is, you know, one of our continuing songs that we do at Farmer's Market Pros is if you're not a farmer's market, if you don't have significant presence of farmers at your market, but you're a community market that brings people together and gives entrepreneurs an opportunity, that's awesome. Call yourself a community market. Please don't call yourself a farmer's market. But obviously we have no control over this. And so if you've got a market that's opened in your area that's calling itself a farmer's market and you're not, and but they're not, um, it will reflect on you in the big picture. And I will tell you that I worried about this a whole bunch seven or eight years ago. It used to absolutely drive me crazy because we have some really big markets in our trade area that are definitely not farmer's markets, but they're called farmer's markets. You only have to have two to be defined as a farmer's market, even if you have a hundred vendors. Um, and we used to say, it's, it makes it really tough for us for marketing because we would tell people come out to the farmer's market and they'd say, yeah, I'm all stocked up on blingy flip-flops. I don't need to come to a farmer's market. So there was a, an impression that they were creating in people's minds of what a farmer's market was that was absolutely not what we wanted people to think about when they thought of a farmer's market. And that concerned me a lot. But the fact is the consumers will figure it out. And if you are providing food with integrity and actual farmers and real food, farm, I think consumers are smarter than they used to be about all this. They really have been exposed to media that makes it clear to them what the difference is in shopping locally and what the economics are of small farmers and farmers markets and how it affects their business. There's still a lot of people that don't know, used to have tons of opportunity to educate people, but I do think they're more discriminating than they used to be in terms of identifying where they want to shop and what kind of offerings are available at their market. You can help that. Um, but I also wouldn't be too worried about it. I'd love to hear if there's anything else, um, Sarah, that's going on with you and the new market and Oh, we have someone who, and there it is. We have someone who's doing a same day adjacent market uh, simply to spite us now. Uh, sure, elaborate off mute. This sounds like a good story. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. And I feel like in my tenure, tenure as a market manager, there's never a year without drama. And this one is my drama for the year. So um, we have somebody that has a property next to our market, our longstanding market. I think it's been in this area for about 20 years and we've grown exponentially. And he got really frustrated when we wanted to expand up to the main street. We had had this property beforehand, but during COVID um, it kind of got retracted. There was a separate legal issue that happened, but what essentially it is, is he, through a fit, it doesn't impede his business. He still has access to his business and his business is kind of like a co-work space that he also charges parking fees for. So it's really interesting. And I think in the meeting, he said that he would try to sue us if we so much as dropped an eyelash on his property during market, but yet now he's saying, I'm just gonna do one to spite you. And so he started a Sunday market. He's not calling it a farmer's market, but he's used some terms very loosely to like indicate that he's part of the main street organization which he's not um and now because he saw the success of our first opening weeks in may he's now like poaching vendors at the market and asking them to come over and he's like i'll just set up a space on thursdays and we'll be adjacent and he's doing this with every event that's happening in town so pride pride festival is this weekend he wanted to set up a beer garden they asked him not to he said i'm going to do it anyways so he's doing this to a lot of different markets, but we're just really trying to make sure people know that this isn't overflow from our market. We're trying to like really indicate in our social media that our footprint is our footprint and our mission statement and all of those different types of things. But I'm just worried that people won't understand that it's different. 
You know, the first thing that comes to my mind on that, Sarah, in terms of making sure that people know that it's not your market is that you might need to concentrate. Social media is great, but it sounds to me like what you need is actual physical, visual advertising and branding. Um, you need to make sure you've got so much signage at every edge of your market that has your logo and your name and all that on it. Um, I'm curious, how is he getting vendors to come over? What is he offering that you're not? Well, higher pricing, so I'm not really sure, but um, a few a few of our vendors who I've known for a long time uh, signed up for his Sunday market, not realizing the issues that he was causing for us. And so I, you know, politely just said, there are some issues, just I want to make you aware your business is your business. You can do what you want to do. And many of them pulled out because they're like, no, I don't want to be associated with somebody like that. So now he's coming back to them and like offering them free electricity, offering them during the Thursday market that I'm talking about. Like, oh, you can just park in the lot for free. And I said, you know, they've told me because, you know, I'm their manager. And I said, you know, do what you're comfortable with. But I would just be really, really cautious of entering into an agreement with that. Um, but I think he's come through the market during our market hours and kind of offered things. He offers them, but then I read through, like, I've I've looked on his website and things. Um, it, everything's at a cost. It's more than we are. Um Electricity is not free. Parking is not free. There's lots of different things that he's trying to offer, but like with caveats. So, <laughs> I mean, it's really tough when you're in that situation. And it sounds like this guy is not, you know, at all one of those market managers is going to communicate and collaborate. Um, <laughs> I mean, in this sort of thing, as frustrating as it is, the way to win is usually to do the old they go low, we go high thing and just keep mm -hmm. doing what you're doing that you do so well. And uh, ramp up the visual in terms of making sure that shoppers and vendors know that you're your market and they are not. Um, but yeah, that's hard. And it sounds in the chat like there's a, you are not the only one who has dealt with this. <laughs> breaks my heart. Like why, why does there have to be so much drama in farmer's markets? I think, you know, we probably see it as there's so much drama in farmer's markets, but I'll bet you if you talk to somebody in grocery, grocery has its own set of drama. And if you talk to somebody in, I don't know, making nuts and bolts, they probably have their own set of dramas. It's just ours seems so personal. And honestly, by definition, at a farmer's markets, we're dealing with a whole bunch of type A business owner kind of personalities. So our drama is going to be a little bit higher. The same energy that it takes to run your own business, to run your own farm, to stand up against obstacles, that energy is going to come to fore when people are talking about their businesses or talking about their markets. So we just inherently maybe have people that are a little bit more expressive and energetic in our business than some businesses have. And that's what makes it interesting, right? Our job is weird. Our job is interesting. All the hashtags. One more question, Kat. Do you have any suggestions on what those signs should say or what that should look like? Uh, yeah, I would just put all over them. Um, the name, is it Snohomish? Is that the market you're dealing with? Yeah. 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 I would just put your logo and name and hours and day really big. And the other thing that you might consider putting on there is one of those things that many businesses signage use that say founded in whatever year you were founded in, how old's your market? We are 33 years old this year. Yeah. See, that's the thing. So I would just lay in heavy on how old your market is so that people understand that you are the market that's been there all this time. He can't really come back and say that if he's brand new. Um, so I would really, really lean on your logo and found it in 1988 or whatever it was. Um, and just, I put signs all over the whole perimeter of my market, if I were you. Okay. Thank you. Put them on your uniforms, do a t-shirt, make sure that no matter where they look inside that market, they know that that's the market they're in. I don't know the history of it, but there's at least a couple markets in Oregon whose official names are the original <laughs> blah, 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 farmer's market. So. I, I got to say, I love uh, Lisa Hall's suggestion. I'd suggest yard signs at the edge of your market saying leaving farmer's market by every possible exit. <laughs> Very clever. Fiona, sounds like you're dealing with a similar thing. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi everyone. I'm in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia. We're about an hour outside of Washington, DC and everything Sarah said is almost exactly what we dealt with last year and this year with the, a couple of exceptions. I'm dealing with a woman 
Um, she moved into a brick and mortar rental space at the corner of our market, which has been on that street for 13 years. She knew full well when she signed the lease that uh, the market was there. She has not once tried to collaborate or communicate with us on what might work best for her vendors who, who are trying to get in for um, her weekend events. Uh, again, like Sarah said, every, they can still access her business from two different entrances. She's poaching our parking lot. She is bullying us on social media. Um, and we are just trying to, in all of our Facebook posts and signage, like, you know, our 13th year, you know, we're trying to iterate, reiterate exactly what you said, Kat, where it's like, we've been here, you know, this is our history. We have so many visitors a year and it's, it's just been a nightmare. It's been very, very stressful. Mm. So it sucks. And on top of that, like, again, like Sarah said, she has tried to start her own little market on her patio, right on the very corner where we are, um, and is encouraging our vendors to come in. She walks her dogs through the market and, and claims that she supports our vendors because she buys like one chrysanthemum. And then we'll talk to our vendors about, hey, you know, do you do you want to come to my little market up on the patio? And it it's it's insane. She's not requiring insurance. She's not requiring any kind of business licensing just to spite us. That's exactly what she's doing is just to spite us. It's been horrible. I mean, in those situations, the, your your best bet is to wait them out. I mean, at some point, all the effort it takes to spite you has to become tiring and they have to come around to the idea that maybe they better pay more attention to their own business. Yes. But yeah, it's really frustrating in the meantime, I'm sure. So the, these two situations don't sound exactly like another farmer's market opening in your area. Um, something that you can approach with sort mm -hmm. of a logical um, thought process sounds more like just really strange, eccentric people that are, are in there for another reason. Um, but I will say that communication usually is the best tact. If you've tried that and they won't, you know, they just won't talk to you at all. There's not much you can do with it, but maybe give it time and then try it again. I have uh, a couple stories of uh, a, a fairly common situation, probably definitely in Oregon and probably elsewhere. Um, the craft market next to the farmer's market situation. In Eugene, Oregon, the farmer's market literally grew out of the, um, of the craft market. And the craft market, at, at least until recent times, was larger. I, I can't say if that's still true. In where I am in Corvallis, Oregon, there's a gravel lot next to my largest farmer's market, our Saturday Corvallis. And they don't, um, it's a craft market. They do not have a website. They barely have any social media. The manager will not let anyone have his phone number. So, and so they, everyone calls me and I have to be their referral service. Um, but, you know, I do it because it's faster to get rid of them that way. I mean, I can, I can, and they're entrepreneurs. I mean, these people didn't do anything wrong. They, they, they just want access to, to, to this market that's next to it. And so we bring thousands and thousands of people next to uh, uh, them, uh, to us. And uh, there's really nothing I feel that I should do about it. We even have to give them space to unload, load and unload, or they wouldn't function. But so I think that some of these kinds of relationships are also very common um, and, and not as troubling as what I just heard. <laughs> Yeah. I have to ask a clarifying question, Rebecca. You had dropped something in the chat about, I think it was you. Who said elephant ears in this chat? Oh yeah. This is uh this is Beaverton Farmers Market. Is there anyone on who is associated with Beaverton in, in Oregon? Um, I can't remember how long ago this was, but um there was a guy who just had residential property next to um you know one of our largest markets in the state and the market did not want to include his product the elephant ears in the market and so to retaliate for that he found a way to force the beaverton market to move off a substantial amount of its um footprint for 
six months while a land use issue was being resolved. And everyone knew that it would be resolved in favor of the market eventually. But because of how our land use system works, it takes time to work through all the all the pieces and parts. So he exacted the most revenge I have ever ex uh, seen an individual enact on a market. And Beaverton is still um, with us today in a healthy market. So they got through it, but it was, you know, imagine having to move a large number of your vendors just because of the vengeance of one man who um, was thwarted in his effort to bring elephant ears to the people. You're talking about literally ears of elephants? Oh, elephant ears is a fair food. That's why I was hoping you meant. But it is. It, it is. I need the clarification. Of, was there an elephant? It, I'm sorry. It is simply <laughs> one of the variations of fried dough with sugar. Got on it. it. Okay. Um, wow. That's that, a lot um, to. Yeah, we don't take deep fried products at most of our markets, and um, that would be an extreme form of retail. Yeah, but that's uh, that's that that was the cost of of trying to maintain the market's identity. Hmm. Crazy. Oh yeah, for sure. No, I totally get. Yeah, we don't do fried stuff. We want people to s smell produce. Um, but wow, that is an extreme reaction. Anybody had a an actual other farmer's market? Not a crazy revenge situation, but an actual farmer's market that wanted to open in your area because there was a need for another farmer's market, but they didn't think through not being on exactly the same day as, and times as you or something that's... Um, more something that could be dealt with on a logical basis. No, oh, we're only dealing with crazy people right now. Okay. When I was a market manager, I had markets reach out to me and ask a lot of really nice questions about like, how do I get started? I want to do this. And we had meetings with them and um, the Rocky Butte farmers market took a, I'm just really impressed. They they started a long time ago, and I think this year is their first year to really be really going. And they're on a street now that's more visible. And um, I just think they moved slowly. And of course, they had to go through the pandemic years. That's part of it. But like they, uh, I think Hollywood and Mo the uh, Montevilla people are here. So I, but this was during my era a little while ago. But I, if they want to chime in and say if they've heard from Rocky Butte at all recently, <laughs> about working together and hopefully it's all still going well, but that they sort of form a triangle of markets that I think um, will show that you're at that point you were making that the more markets there are, the more people shop at farmers markets and the more they want more options for farmers markets. And I think it happened positively. Yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the positive news. Uh, um, oh, there we this go. Is Melissa. Hi, this is Melissa from Coos Bay. We had an unusual situation um, Coos Bay kind of wraps around North Bend. So unless you really know where the lines are, it looks like one city. We actually had a board member start a farmer's market up in North Bend on Saturday. We're currently on Wednesdays. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of confusion to begin with. Um, he's actually on our board and he's actually one of our sponsors and vendors in our market. So there was a lot of confusion. I think it's kind of working itself out. But there is a, still a lot of confusion. We had people apply for that market thinking it was this market. The other thing is the person that's helping run that other market is the other Mel that I trained. So mm. they're hearing Mel and thinking it's me. So there, there's a lot of confusion, but I think we're slowly working it out. Did they talk to you before they decided to open? Yes and no. Mm. So originally they came to me and they, they came to the board, said, hey, this is what we're doing. It was supposed to be at on tribal lands and it was going to be a much smaller market. And I said, great, you know, if you need help, let me know. This is what you want to do. I mean, I gave him the game plan. You know, this is who you want to contact. This is what you want to do. The next thing I know, now it's at Pony Village and their, their marketing is straight at us. We're going to be the biggest and best market. We're doing this. That other market can't do that. So oh. there was, yeah. Uh -huh. And yeah. I have to be really careful because it's our one of our board members. So normally when I'm planning stuff, I go to the board and I go, this is what we're doing. This is what we got planned going on. But what was happening was I would do that and he could move faster and put it in play before I could. Uh, and have you called him out on that? Yeah, 
I Especially did. the part where we're going to be the best and the biggest and the other market can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, mean, I said, we, um, hey, you should have given me a little heads up on this piece. That's hey, exactly what I said. Hey, this person has a duty of loyalty while they're on your board, legally under Oregon law. Well, they've looked into that. And the board we have is not the board just for our market. We are run under the Coos Bay Downtown Association, which is part of Main Street. So the board is not Farmer's Market Board. It's the Main Street Board. Yeah. So it's a little bit still. different. And they've, right, yeah. Rebecca, I know, they've looked into it. They've done all that pieces. I'm just letting you know what my piece is. The board is handling that piece. But this is the piece that I'm having to deal with. The other thing is, is they, um, so when I talked to him about it, I said, hey, you know, you should have given me a heads up. And he goes, well, I'm an advertising guy. It's just an advertising thing. And the mayor is doing it, which is true. North Bend and Coos Bay have a huge rivalry. It's like the civil war all over again. And so I know the mayors really play against each other. So I can see the mayor really pushing it and doing a lot of stuff, which they are. North Bend is waving a bunch of stuff because they're in a parking lot where we're in a, up on a public street, they're in a private parking lot. So they can do a lot of stuff. We can't. Yeah. And so that's coming back. Well, how come you can't do this? I'm on a public street. I can't talk to, I just, I just put it up to the Coos Bay. I'm like, talk to Coos Bay. City of Coos Bay won't allow us. So Melissa, and, what are, you, are you feeling any actual effect on your market? Are you, you yeah, we are a little bit. We are a little bit. It's still fairly new because that market just opened. Oh, yeah. um, we both just different. opened in May. So we'll see a little bit more. Um, he was having a really hard time getting farmers because mm -hmm. our markets are, are we could do we do both. Like we have the farmers there. We have farm additive. We have arts and crafts. We have a full food court, all those pieces. So we're much bigger that way. But our farmers are number one. He's having a really hard time getting farmers. And that was the whole thing that him and some other people, well, we need to switch ours to Saturday. And I said, we can't. I mean, we're 24 years. We're, we're not going to switch because a lot of our farmers are on a rotation. They're already booked for Fridays and Saturdays. They're booked on Tuesdays. We're the Wednesday. There's another farm. Uh, another market is on Thursdays here on the Oregon coast. So, I mean, that's why Wednesdays were chosen for us. Gotcha. But it's, so it sounds like long term, if everything settles down, it might actually be good for you. There might just be more. Marketing. I think it might be. I think it's just right now there's a lot of marketing mess with it. And like I said, I just got to negotiate how I'm doing stuff a little differently with my board. Yeah. Hey, Kira, do you want to talk to us at all about I kind of vaguely went through your situation. Do you want to chat with us at all about um, Hillsborough and Aloha and Forest Grove and and all that? Um, I think that you uh, pretty much covered all the bases on it. Um, I, I, I think that, you know, um, where we're at right now is it's just, it's another market that is near us. And um, it's really too soon to tell if anything has changed at, at our market. Um, you know, it may be too small. You know, e even in any decline that we may have right now could be attributed to the economy. So, I mean, it's just kind of don't really don't really know. Hard to say. So plan it out. So my understanding mm -hmm. was they were originally going to be on the same day as you and that you were able with a conversation and you and Sage up at Forest Grove and Amanda that you were even though it sounds like they haven't been real responsive and gotten back to you a lot. And again, we talked about maybe that's because the manager there is new, but it does sound like you at least kind of moved them off of Thursdays since they're so very close to you and to Wednesdays. So, right. Or are you on Wednesday and they moved to Thursday, but um, they're not on the same day as you anymore. Correct. No, well, we're, we're a Thursday market and right. um, from three to seven. And then last year they wanted to do a test uh, pilot market and they held it on the same day as our market right and I was initially questioning because you know the, there was a new market so close to us it's um, right in the area where we that we um, advertise in um, based on the Aloha Reedville Cooper Mountain study that was done in 2014 and so um, yeah I think so it was just initially that, and they said, 
and they said they couldn't um, move the date. They had to do it on a Thursday. Um, so but on after, a basis, after that, I was be Wednesday, right? Yeah, I wasn't part of the planning of what day it would end up being on. Um, and naturally, that would probably in my in mine and my boards thought was that's when it would be because they have a Tuesday night market. Um, anyways. Uh, so yes, they did. They, they ended up doing it on a Wednesday. And for this year, they're doing it the second Wednesday of the month. And then they plan on next year moving weekly, um, maybe every other week. I think that they, they themselves, of course, they had a really good first market. Um, and then uh, they need to see um, how it works out for them this year. Right, right. So even though they didn't respond and seem to acknowledge that your concern was why they changed days, I mean, it I sounds to me like maybe that outreach and having a conversation and and Sage at Forest Grove having a conversation with them probably did have some effect and and maybe they just haven't thought through before that they shouldn't be on a Thursday right next to you. Um, <laughs> so so hopefully the Wednesday thing will work out and and everybody will do well. Thank mm -hmm. you for the time that you spent chatting with me too. That was really. Sure. It, was interesting to get that whole story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thank you. Thanks. Is Aisha, it, Aisha put a Aisha. lovely story in the chat and also yeah, noticing that. Here too. So yeah, is it Stacia? Stacia. So it says uh, when we first opened the Bonanza market, it was two Saturdays a month in the afternoon. The Klamath market is also Saturday in the morning. So for that reason, they chose to switch to Friday evenings. So many people requesting a weekday evening market. Charlie's been amazing with us and has great ideas for working with together. When marketing, I'm pitching double up on your double up, which is such, <clears throat> that's a great idea. Uh, encouraging patrons to shop both markets to get more double up funds, which is really smart. Uh, thinking about it now, we should be advertising to triple and shop Klamath Grown as well. So it sounds like you guys are doing a really good job of cooperating and stretching your advertising dollars and also encouraging people to go to more markets. We do something similar. We've got a, a limit on the match that you can get at any one attendance as a, as a market. And my team is so about, hey, look, this is what you need to do. You need to go to Pacific Beach on Tuesday and you need to go to, to us on Wednesday and you need to go to um, North Park on Thursday. And they teach people how to actually collect more double up bucks through the week than they would if they just did all their shopping at one market, which I think it's great. I mean, you're really helping the community there at the same time as you're getting people in the habit of shopping at farmer's markets, no matter what their situation. Did you want to say anything else about that, Stacia or Charlie? And I could be pronouncing Stacia wrong, and I apologize if I am. No, you're right. It's Stacia. Um, yeah, that's everybody that comes to get their EBT in Bonanza. I'm telling them, okay, well, you know, here's your $20 match. Make sure you go check out Klamath market tomorrow morning so that you can get another free 20 bucks. And I've seen, I'm a vendor at the Klamath market too. Um, I'm a producer. And so I've had a lot of shoppers from Bonanza. I saw last week on Saturday come to Klamath. They're like, thank you so much for telling me to do this. And they were really pleased. So hopefully that continues and it can just keep generating more business for both of our markets. And uh, yeah, I just remembered that Klamath Grown, they do the double up there too. So Stacia, did you I need to start any... telling people to go shop there because they've got a lot of Yeah, so smart. Did you get input from producers in terms of whether it would be easier for them to do a morning and afternoon market on Saturday or a um, Friday and then Saturday market? I did. We had a meeting um, after our last market of last season. Um, with all the vendors and we all we just kind of talked to collaborate and um, everybody really, really liked the idea of doing a Friday evening market because there's a lot of my vendors do other events that go on in the weekends during the summer and then there's a couple of my vendors wanted to do Klamath Falls market this year um, and then I have some vendors that do a Thursday evening market in Merrill. Um, so Friday was a really good option for us. And our season's been crazy so far. Crazy in a good way? 
crazy in a good way. Yeah, we had to get more double up funding because we burned through it in the first two months. Yeah, and job. it's just all of the, everybody who vended last year, like we've all had, everybody's had double the sales that they had last season already. Um, so it's been really great. It's good to hear. And Jessica, you were saying, and this is sad, another market manager from our area applied to work at our market, stayed for a month to get trained on how we do things, and then quit and is now trying to filter our vendors. Never a good idea. And I know that smaller markets oftentimes feel like they're incubators for larger markets in terms of vendors and farmers. You spend a lot of time teaching people how to be a vendor and how to operate well, and then they go on to a bigger market that has um, bigger sales. And, and while that's not fun... Um, one of the communication things and collaboration things that you might look at is how maybe there's different kinds of grant support and things out there for you as an incubator market versus somebody that's too big really to to qualify for some of those local local things in terms of subsidies and and such. Uh, Jessica was was the person that you worked with were they a market manager before they applied? They were, and they were open about the fact that they were going to be opening a midweek market, but um, he clearly didn't make all of his um, intentions known. Got it. Yeah, that's frustrating. I mean, it's frustrating. And then if you want to look at it in a good light, hopefully you taught him the way to do it right. So at least he's not running a market where you can bend with no insurance and you can bend with no permits and things. So at least you trained the competing market to not be telling your vendors different things than you tell your market vendors. Oh, Sarah, you are so right. She says, I feel like we should host a reality television show. I was actually, I mean, we're in California, so there's a lot of that around. And we were actually approached about that in a fairly serious way about five or six years ago. But I also had friends that were chefs that had been on Top Chef. And I will assure you that reality television producers are not looking to minimize conflict. <laughs> Yeah, with it bleeds, it leads. They are trying to make sure that there is as much conflict as possible to make it a good show. And that is certainly not what we want at our market. So, Oh, no. Um, I wanted <laughs> at Charlie Clown Falls Farmer's Market just to right. say how much I appreciate the, our, our situation here. I know there's a lot of problems and issues and drama at markets, but here our primary issue is 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 finding producers and recruiting and, and supporting the the ones that we have and that's been a a, a thing the whole time I've, I've managed the market is sometimes if you don't have enough producers and you having trouble finding producers is helping the existing producers grow from one space to two spaces to three spaces and 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 helping them uh so that's one way to do it but in the communication uh realm and collaborating like i said we're really fortunate here and sarah with klamath grown um is is a complementary uh, organization as far as i'm concerned and i've always supported them they have been through some growing pains over the last six seven years but i think we're we're really moving forward with with good stuff going going forward and it's this won't work i'm sure with with every market or even most markets but we've invited sarah actually sits on our board as an ex officio board member um okay. uh so she's non voting but she's in on on the discussions um and and all that so we don't see um at least here <laughs> and like i said it doesn't work everywhere but for us it's a uh, climate grown is a complementary organization as well as bonanza um it's uh, yeah, and Stacia is a rock star. She's a farmer, which and then taking it upon herself to create and and support her her small community of Bonanza with with their own farmers market and growing that. I, I, you know, I feel uh, I'm actually you know honored to help them uh, grow and get something going. It's a community thing, you know. The public spaces and the social aspect of markets is so important, also. Yeah, absolutely. It sounds like you got a terrific community going there. And, you know, one of the positive things about more markets is that as you're trying to grow new farmers and young farmers, they may not be able to make enough sales at one market a week to make this a financially viable lifestyle for them. So having additional markets in your area so that they can actually grow or can sell everything that they grow is one way we keep farmers farming. And that's really, I think, no matter what the differentiation is on our markets, I think that's the base thing that we all have in common is that we're trying to keep farmers farming. And to do that, we, more opportunity is better for them. 
Um, that obviously does not apply to people who open weird fried food revenge markets. <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's a whole different thing. <laughs> Um, if I think it's Mara is still on here. Um, yeah, Rebecca, for sure. Um, once I underline the idea that snap and, and double up food bucks are reasons to want other markets to succeed. So, I mean, that's another nice thing about communicating with a new market that's coming into your area rather than taking sort of a defensive stance is you want to make sure that they know how important those things are. Because again, it helps your farmers succeed and it helps your community eat and um, new markets may not be aware of those programs. So anything that we can do to make the market side of things stronger um, keeps more people coming to markets instead of necessarily wandering off to big box stores. If Mara's still on here, um, I'd like to know if you're involved with Stay Rad, Stay Local and, and how that's worked for you, because that just sounds like a brilliant example of cooperation between markets rather than considering each other competitors. And she may be. I don't think places. Mara is here, but that's a Portland thing. So any of the Portland yeah. markets that are part of that could chime in. Anybody else here part of that? No, maybe not. Yeah, I can I can talk about it a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, I think this actually started for a um, the National Farmers Market Week, like a celebration for that uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Hillsdale's been um, spearheading, creating the uh, almost like, I guess not a bingo card, but um, yeah, like you were saying, it's if you can go to five different markets in the Portland area within a couple of months, then you get a prize from one of the markets. And uh, I don't know in our market if we've necessarily seen a big difference, but I know some of the smaller markets has a, like specifically seen folks come and like want to get their stamp. And uh, it's been really good to kind of, yeah, just get on the, on everyone's radar. Cause I think it's important because there's so many markets in Portland. We're all like, yeah, go to your, go to your neighborhood. Don't drive 10 miles to, to come to my market, like go to the one that's in your neighborhood. Uh, Cause that's like how it'll actually become a little bit more sustainable too, for them to yeah. grocery shopping. No, I think it's a brilliant program. Um, and I can definitely see that would work in our neighborhood. It sounds like it would work in a lot of places, especially a more developed or more urban area where there's a lot of markets that are, you know, not miles and 15 or 16 miles apart, but, you know, relatively in the same universe. Do you, uh, how do you work that out in terms of prizes or promotion or paying for that kind of program? It sounds like there's not a ton of overhead, right? Other than maybe a prize to people that turn in the passport. Yeah, it's kind of each market. Uh, I guess that part's not necessarily the most organized. It's kind of like, well, if, if people turn it in at your market, then you'll have a different prize. Uh, so each market like decides on their own. Um I don't think there's been a huge volume of like people turning it in, but a lot of folks will do like, oh, uh, uh, here's a tote bag, or we did um, uh, like coupons to a pops one of our popsicle vendors in the market. Um, so different things, but I, I I do know there's been some customers that are like, what what's your prize? And we'll go to another market <laughs> okay. if they like. There's more, but <laughs> yeah, and then <laughs> yeah, yeah. So they're they're scoping. Um, and then the markets who are on the, uh, like the brochure, the trifold, um, they just all pay a little bit of money for, uh, for the printing of it. Yeah. Cool. No, it sounds like a really, really good program. So there's a lot of markets near you, just like there's a lot of markets near us in San Diego. Do you find that you get worried if you hear another market's opening in your area or has that not, not been much of an issue? Um, I think for our market we don't get really worried i think because we've hit a specific size and and success uh more to say like we have a decent customer base and so if another market is thinking about opening in our area it's uh i guess it's not it's not necessarily a huge threat like i was saying before rocky beats fairly close to us but um they're on a different day and they're serving a different neighborhood and uh smaller and so it's like yeah like let's get y'all up and running and then if we can get people who 
have so our markets on Sunday if, if someone has a Sunday plan but they go to the Saturday market then that's great and then the next time they have a Saturday plan they'll come to the Sunday market so yeah I think just having the option of people can uh, get farm direct produce um, in our neighborhood no matter like what day on the weekend it, I think can be beneficial in the long term Yeah, I think so too. And a lot of times we've had uh, like some folks be like, oh, hey, like we want you to open a market here, like just a couple blocks away. And and our question is always like, why? Um, Yeah. and a lot of times it's, you know, oh, because we want to utilize this space or because these three people want it. And it's like, that's not a good enough reason. That's not actually going to make it successful. And, and so, yeah, if a, a small market pops up who doesn't have the customer base or that, that community need, then it's kind of like, well, it, it might not be the most successful market anyway. Um, so we'll kind of like let it ride out, but definitely sometimes it gets you a little, a little mad at first. <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, that's obviously a natural reaction. Like, what's going to affect my business that is not in my control. Um, we have occasionally been approached by people, for instance, from a chamber of commerce that wants to open a market basically right next to a market run by the rotary or <laughs> it's like, guys, <laughs> let's think this through. <laughs> so um, yeah, you got to, I love that you say why that's exactly what we say. Why do you, why do you want a market? Why do you want to do a market and make sure that um, all of those elements are in place that actually makes it make sense to open a new market. I think we're coming up on time. Any, I'm happy to stay over if there are more questions, but anybody have another question or contribution that you want to make sure we get in? So this isn't a question. It's mostly, uh, I guess, I guess you would call it com a complaint, but we uh, recently have had multiple people be multiple customers be upset at us because we don't have vegetables in like April. And it's like, yeah, cause they're all this big. And, and where are your bananas? <laughs> I know. And we <laughs> recently had a, like a bad Google review because um, we didn't have any strawberries in the market. the week before strawberry vendor started. And, and so I, I responded and tried and like was nice. And it's like, we don't have any berry vendors that are growing in, in hoop houses. So we don't have those super early varieties. Um, but like, I promise we will in the next couple weeks and, or people will have the first strawberries of the season. We're like, Oh, this isn't that good. I'm like, yeah, yeah. It's the first strawberries of the season. They're never good. Keep, <laughs> keep buying. Um, so that's, can be uh, hard or like having markets in the area that do have um, vendors who are growing more under hoop houses. And so they'll like right. be having cucumbers right now. And you're like, but don't tell people that because it's not cucumber season yeah. yet in, <laughs> yeah. in our area. So yeah. I think that's something that can be interesting being around so many different markets. Yeah, that can be frustrating. I think it's kind of plays to what Sarah was saying earlier. It's I mean, it might be great to have a lot of farmer's markets, but if you have farmer's markets or farmer's markets in your area that are maybe are doing resale produce and things that are imported um, near you, that can be rough because it then confuses people further about that you really are only going to have seasonal food at your market. And if I have one more person ask me why we don't have bananas, I'd tell you what. <laughs> Sarah says she's working on a podcast episode where you just read our bad reviews, like mean tweets done by celebrities. Next time you're in San Diego, Sarah, we will take you to the restaurant down the street from our market in um, Little Italy, where the restaurant has a soundtrack inside its restrooms of people reading bad Yelp reviews out loud. So I'm, so, I'm so in. <laughs> just embrace it. Just embrace it. Um, I think that's all we've got, unless somebody has a burning question. It has been a pleasure, as always, being with y'all. And we have another workshop with Kat coming up in just a few weeks. That's right. So hope you all can come back for that. Um, we put the link in the chat and go to our register, go to the events page on our website and sign up. Thanks, guys. Whoops, one new message. Thanks, everybody. Thank See you. you. Thanks for being here. And <laughs> thanks to um, Kira and Sage from Aloha and, uh, and Forest Grove for talking to me at length about their situation so we could hear about that. Bye.